Amos is one of the minor prophets. The minor prophets aren't called by that name because they were less significant. They're called minor because we have less of their writings, less of their words, less of their lives. Books like I, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel are big books. We have a lot of their writings, a lot of their sermons, and we know about them and, and their lives. The minor prophets are those smaller books with the sometimes hard to pronounce names that are at the end of your Old Testament. Amos is one of them. And Amos was a prophet in the kingdom of Israel during the reign of a king named Jeroboam. It was a good time for Israel, at least in terms of political power and economic prosperity. People were working. There was no war. Many people were doing well, and on the surface, things looked good. But on the inside, things weren't so good. Uh, Israel was like a rotten apple, pleasant on the outside, but rotten and terrible at the core. Israel's happiness and prosperity often came at the expense of others. Much of what Israel enjoyed came by way of unjust practices. Not everyone was treated equally. Not everyone was doing things honestly. Nothing wrong with a country prospering. Every nation wants that. But there's something wrong when a nation prospers by injustice or favoritism or, or wrongdoing to the people who are citizens of that very place. And not only were there unjust political and ec economic practices, but the religious life of Israel was unhealthy. What people said they believed in worship on the Sabbath wasn't what they lived the rest of the week. At one place in the book of Amos, the Lord tells Israel to stop bringing their sacrifices and their acts of devotion. And then God says this, take away from me the noise of your songs to the melody of your harps. I will not listen, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. God had had enough of their noisy ego music. He wanted justice. He wanted oceans of it. God wanted fairness. He wanted rivers of it. And he still does. But things in the nation look good on the service. Israel believed that God was blessing them. They believed they were in his favor and all was well. But Amos was the Lord's microphone through which he let it be known that was not the case. Now at this time, Israel had split into a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. Israel was the northern part. Judah was the southern part. Jerusalem was the capital of the southern kingdom. That was home to the temple. But a temple had also been built for the northern kingdom in a city called Bethel. That was the national cathedral of Israel. When the king went to church, that's where he went. Bethel. And Amaziah was the chief priest at Bethel. He was the head of all the religious goings-on. The chief priest, it was a position of power. It was a position of influence. It was coveted by other priests in the land because the chief priest was part of the king's cabinet. You had the ear of the king. And it was right smack dab in the middle of that temple at Bethel that Amos confronted the complacency of King Jeroboam and the nation of Israel. And Amos came to the priest Amaziah with a message to Jeroboam that the king would die by the sword, that Israel would lose its land and be taken into exile someplace else to be slaves. Boy, talk about a tough message to bring to the top, huh? And this would all happen because of the injustice that was permeating the land and their empty worship of God. You can say one nation under God, but God knows if that's true or not. And to say this to the king didn't fit with his plan for their greatness and for their destiny. Amos and Amaziah both know this. 
And when Amaziah gives Amos' message to the king, Amaziah says, you know, this land is not able to bear all his words. That's what he says. The land can't handle this kind of message. It isn't good for morale. It doesn't feed the national spirit. You know, the Bible is full of classic showdowns, isn't it? Um, Moses and Pharaoh. Uh, David and Goliath. Jesus and Pilate. I think Amaziah and Amos needs to be on that list. Amaziah, the chief priest and the religious head of Israel, comes to the prophet Amos and tells him to get lost and to go earn his bread somewhere else in another land. In essence, Amaziah talks down to Amos. And he implies Amos is only doing this for the money. He sees Amos as some kind of traveling roadshow that stops wherever people are willing to listen. He certainly doesn't see him as being sent by God. Amos refuses to take, excuse me, Amaziah, the priest, refuses to take Amos seriously. And he forbids him to ever preach again at Bethel. For as he says, it is the king's sanctuary and it is a temple of the kingdom. And right there is a clue to how Amaziah thinks. It illustrates what happens when church and state become confused and mixed up together. You see, to the chief priest Amaziah, it wasn't God's sanctuary. It was the king's sanctuary. He didn't see it as a temple of the Lord. He saw it as a kingdom of Jeroboam. Whenever the worship of the Lord is seen as belonging to any human authority, we're in dangerous territory, and the Lord will not stand for it. When Amaziah tells Amos to shut up and go away, Amos says this, I'm no prophet, nor am I a prophet's son, but I'm a herdsman. I'm a dresser, I'm a farmer of sycamore, fig trees, and the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, go and prophesy to my people Israel. In other words, Amos says, look, I didn't sign up for this. This isn't what I was raised to do. I know sheep, I know farming, speaking for the Lord, not me. Amos knew he was only an amateur. But beware of amateurs. Amaziah is the priest of the National Temple. He probably comes from a long line of family of priests. He's a professional, possibly very eloquent, in with the powerful of Israel, the educated, the knowledgeable, the influential. But Amos was the one to watch out for. Amos says, I'm not a prophet. What does he mean he's not a prophet? He's acting like a prophet. He's speaking like a prophet. What he meant was he didn't presume to speak God's call or to speak for God. He didn't presume upon that call. It wasn't a matter of human capacity or anything he had in himself. Furthermore, Amos says, I'm not even the son of a prophet. You see, prophets were often raised up from a family of prophets. Amos knew this ministry it wasn't a matter of human choice. It wasn't a matter of study. It wasn't a matter of preparing or conditioning. Uh, he had no background. He had no resume in this. Nothing to prepare him for this. Amos says, the Lord took me from following the flock. Amos stands there speaking the will of the Lord because the Lord laid it upon him. But he was a farmer. That's what he knew. But one day, and we aren't even told how, we're not given the story, the Lord said to him, leave your flock and go speak to my people, Israel. Just an amateur. You know, it's interesting how the Lord sometimes prefers amateurs. Uh, those who you wouldn't bet your money on to speak or minister for him. Think of Moses. You know, he didn't even make it to be a priest. Aaron did, his brother, not Moses. But it was Moses who the Lord said, you go speak to Pharaoh. Moses couldn't even speak well. And the Lord said he couldn't speak well. So I know you're not eloquent. Yet it he was used by God. Think of David, the shepherd boy. 
He wasn't even considered as a realistic possibility when Samuel the prophet knew he was supposed to go anoint a new king, yet David became God's king. And then there was Peter and John. We read about them in the, in the passage in Acts this morning. Fishermen chosen by Jesus to be disciples. And we read how they prayed and they healed the lame man in the temple in the name of Jesus. And when they were questioned by the temple authorities, as Amos was also questioned by temple authorities, um, they spoke with great and impressive boldness. That's what it said. They spoke with great boldness. And this surprises the high priest who recognizes Peter and John. And we quote, they were uh, unlearned or uneducated and common men. How can unlearned, unschooled, and common people do what they do and speak as they speak? How is it that God's power is more real in them than those who are in charge of religion? Is it possible that if the Lord can take Amos from his flock and from tending sycamore trees and use him, that he can take us from wherever we are and use us for his purposes? You know, the Lord's power isn't limited to those with formal seminary training or any theological training for that matter. I mean, training's good. I'm for training. I think it's good to be educated. I think it's good to have experience, practice, but beware that the Lord might choose and use an amateur. The Lord can take and use a chef and make him or her the teacher of a Sunday school class and influence lives. He can take a farmer and make him or her a preacher. He can, he can take a mail deliverer and make him or her someone who influences young people in the paths of the Lord. The Lord can take a high school dropout and make that person a pillar in his church. Some of you already got that memo because you're doing it here. For all of us, Amos is a correction to the thinking, well, we better leave it up to the minister. Uh, this isn't to dismiss the call to ordain ministry. I don't want to talk myself out of a job. I think we need people with a special call to preach and to teach and to pray and to, to, to lead for the sake of order in our churches. The Bible affirms that. But we might think again what it really means sometimes to, to minister and to be ordained. Is it formal training? Is it having a reverend before your name? Or is there something more? Serving the Lord is a matter of God choosing us and then activating us by his spirit. The Lord raises people up to speak for him or do his work. Like Amos, maybe not much training. We may not be professional. But that doesn't matter if the Lord calls us to serve. Scripture tells us it's the Holy Spirit who gives gifts to people to serve God, and the Spirit gives gifts to people as he chooses, as he determines. And there's no lone rangers just declaring themselves called by God. It takes the wise confirmation of others, too. But just because some Amaziah comes along and says, you're not of God, doesn't disqualify somebody. I'm willing to bet that for many of us, the main influence in our lives as Christians was not a pastor, but that it was a parent or a teacher or a youth leader or, or other family or friends. And it was a mother maybe, or maybe it was a truck driver or a coach or a secretary or a laborer or people the Lord used in our lives who didn't have anything to do with professional ministry. You know, one of the failures of the church over the years has been to give people a sense that the only real way you serve God is that you become a minister. That couldn't be farther from the truth. In fact, you may be able to serve the Lord better by not being a church professional. Don't be surprised if the Lord calls you from your flock, just like he called Amos, to do something for him. Now you can argue, well, I don't have the qualifications. It won't work. It goes all the way back to Moses. It never works with God. Moses came up with excuse after excuse. When God lays a calling on someone or somebody, he just does it. It may not matter if you have the experience or the training or the background. 
Imagine, imagine a hiring agency um, in Jesus' day. Let's call them uh, Galilee Management Consultation Agency. And uh, imagine them interviewing the 12 apostles that Jesus chooses. And imagine those 12 men that Jesus had picked and, and, and they fill out applications and they submit them to the consultants and they take a battery of tests. You know, that's what we do today, don't we? And the, and the results are run through the computer and there's personal interviews with each of the 12. They meet with a psychologist. They meet with a vocational aptitude consultant. And the profiles of the tests of the 12 apostles are provided to Jesus for him to study. And the consultants get back with their comments for guidance. And they lend their professional opin opinion. And, and, and maybe it's something like this. To Jesus, son of, son of Joseph, carpenter shop, Nazareth, from Galilee Management Consultants. Dear sir, it is the staff opinion that most of your nominees are lacking in background, education, and vocational aptitude for the type of enterprise that you have given them. They do not have a team concept. We would recommend that you continue your search for persons of experience and managerial ability and proven capability. And then it goes on, maybe something like this. He named, they name the 12. Well, P Simon Peter is emotionally unstable and given to fits of temper. Andrew has absolutely no qualities of leadership. Those two brothers, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, place personal interest above company loyalty. Thomas demonstrates a questioning attitude that could undermine morale. We feel that it is our duty to tell you that Matthew had been blacklisted by the Greater Jerusalem Better Business Bureau. James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus definitely have radical leanings, and they both registered a high score on the manic depressive scale. One of the candidates, however, shows great potential. He's a man of great ability and resourcefulness, and he meets people well. He has a keen business mind, and he has contacts in high places. He is highly motivated, ambitious, and responsible. We recommend Judas Iscariot as your controller and right-hand man. All of the other profiles are self-explanatory. We wish you every success in your new venture. Sincerely, Galilean Management Consultants. Amos said he wasn't a prophet or even a disciple of a prophet. But the Lord took me. But the Lord took me. And he said, you go prophesy. Sometimes we don't know why us. But the Lord just takes us. And he gives us a prompting. He gives us a call. He gives us a mission, a ministry. And he says, go. And if he does it, he will give us his spirit as well. And if God has sent us, then let the hearer, let the Amaziahs beware. Be alert for the calling that God has for you. Let's pray. Father, it is amazing that you will use farmers like Amos and common un unschooled folk like Peter and John. And you seem to be trying to tell us something. Let us, let you use us. Make us open to your call in our lives. Amen.